In this edition of Southern Newsweek, vandals in Invercargill smash scores of windows, Dunedin children learn self-defence and self-discipline through martial arts, and a century-old traction engine cuts the chaff near Timaru. Kia ora, I'm Holly Buchanan. A number of businesses along an Invercargill street were the target of vandals in the early hours of Tuesday morning. Nith Street business owners arrived at their properties to find smashed windows and thousands of dollars worth of damage. Just weeks before the opening of Invercargill's new trampoline park, owner John Smart didn't count on this. He arrived at work this morning to find smashed windows glass-covered floors and rocks thrown through the walls of his new building. It's probably $12,000 worth of windows here, if not more. So have the police said anything to you? No, it's under investigation and they'll do a good job. They, they will get on top of this. The CCTV is probably going to catch someone out, no doubt. So, um, yeah, and hopefully they'll get brought to justice. And it wasn't just Smart's business targeted by the vandals. With the building attached to St Mary's Basilica undergoing repairs today, as well as a number of other businesses in the Nith Street area. It's just sad that it's not just us, it's a lot of other businesses have been affected. Um, well it makes you wonder what's in people's brains to do such terrible damage. Um, yeah, really sad. They're throwing rocks so hard that they've actually embedded themselves in the, in the jib board gone through two windows upstairs, like not just one window, gone through two. It's, it's just phenomenal. Police said there had been a significant amount of damage done to properties throughout Invercargill between the hours of 3 and 8am. Anyone with information should contact police on 021 191 8698 or call the Invercargill Police Station on 03 211 0400. Sharon Rees, The South Today. Dunedin's home to New Zealand's Oni Gracie Humaita, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym. Self-defence skills taught there are now being passed on to a younger generation as proud parents look on. Ben Bootsma has the story. It's not just a sport for adults. Gracie Jiu-Jitsu's kids' classes have doubled in size in the last two years. Mixing discipline, fun and agility, the weekly classes are becoming a staple of kids' sporting activities. Justin Colpan's son Ali joined jiu-jitsu because a family member did it. But he says the classes have grown since he started. Uh, Ali's been doing jiu-jitsu with Grace Jiu-Jitsu for two years now and um, he's really enjoying it. He's, uh, the class has grown immensely in the time he's been here. Um, it's, uh, I'd say it's at least double, possibly even more than that. Colpan says jiu-jitsu has helped develop fundamental skills of balance, flexibility and coordination. All of a sudden I've already half escaped. Doing the training is really good for their balance um, and just you know their body experience so they know what they can do with their bodies. Good exercise, good for flexibility um, and like you say, your fun is always the main thing that we talk about is that you've got to make sure you're enjoying it. Otago rugby coach Ben Herring has been coming to classes with his kids for two months and says the success of the sport is down to the way it is taught. My daughter and my son both come here and they love it. They enjoy physical stuff anyway, but uh, the way these guys coach here at Gracie Jiu Jitsu is just awesome. Ryan and his team just uh, practical examples of real life situations and my kids just absolutely love it. They come home and try to wrestle me with all these new moves. He says the positives of the sport are really beneficial for his kids. Yeah, well, the, the best thing is that you can see their minds ticking. Like when uh, we have a play wrestle at home, I can see them working out the ways out, how to get out of things, uh, just understand their bodies a lot better. Gracie Jiu Jitsu kids' classes are for teaching kids discipline and control while having fun and learning how to defend themselves. Ben Bootsma, The South Today. And visitors to the South Canterbury Traction Engine and Transport Museum stepped back in time last Saturday for the club's annual chaff-cutting fundraiser. This afternoon, today went for a look. 
club members of the South Canterbury Traction Engine and Transport Museum cranked up an ancient traction engine and chaff cutter, adding a dynamic attraction to the museum's usual Saturday afternoon open day at Seadown, just north of Timaru. While the main objective of the day was to cut chaff to sell as horse feed to raise funds, Club President Daniel Crossan said the public had a chance to see the traction engine in action. The club was founded 54 years ago and we still retain a founding member from them days. And our main role is here today, cut the chaff, but we're open to the public as you'll see people wandering around and see what yesteryear was all about. The traction engine they were using to drive the cutter is over a century old, but still going strong. We have a 1912 fail attraction engine, and then we have the chaff cutter that is turning the sheaves into chaff into the bags at the other end. The club's museum displays a large number of antique vehicles, but club members have their own personal collections, which would probably quadruple the number on display. New members are always welcome and the possibility of buying an old vintage tractor for around $200 to $500 is an affordable way to become part of the club. The Timaru Courier for the South Today. Still to come on Southern News Week, Invercargill proves to be one of the cheapest places to buy petrol in the South Island and a Frankton man faces eviction from the local campground. Welcome back. New Zealand petrol prices have reached record levels with a few southern towns recording some of the highest prices. Motorists in Queenstown are paying up to $2.45 a litre for 91 octane fuel. However, cheap petrol can be found in Invercargill with prices below $2.20 a litre. Prices nationally have surged to around $2.30 a litre for 91 octane fuel beating the previous high of $2.27 in mid-2013. In Queenstown, 95 octane is at $2.45 a litre, and it's $2.36 a litre for 91. While some in Invercargill are enjoying 91 octane at just $2.19 a litre, motorists in Dunedin, Invercargill and Queenstown don't think paying more will affect their motoring habits. Probably not. I have to drive for work. We are just starting to think about it because we travel out of town most weekends to a uh, country place, so uh, yeah, got to think about that. Actually, I never um, looked at the patrol price, personally, and all I have to do is $50 patrol every time when I run out from the patrol. I still need to fill the car up, I still have to do what I have to do. Well, I already carpool, so I already try to spend as little on petrol as possible. I think because I do some driving out of the region, it will make me think twice. It does affect it, for sure. For sure, yeah, I try and reduce the amount of driving that I do. Yeah, we buy two bicycles. I live with my boyfriend and we share the car, so we uh, buy two bicycles so he can uh, come to the Queenstown Queenston area. Um, probably not day to day, but I guess you're probably inclined to take less... Um less long distance holidays for leisure. Just like this week I've been thinking more about taking my bike to work. Um, last night I caught the bus for the first time. We have a business so we don't have an option basically, we have to drive. BP spokeswoman Lee Taylor says that the price is influenced by various factors, including the cost of refined oil products on the international market, the exchange rate, international and local shipping logistics, taxes, levies and local operating costs. All of which was cold comfort for people in the south, many of whom have noticed the steady price increases. It has yeah, caused me a bit of concern and anxiety. Um, I guess it's just another added cost to our daily living and uh, there's definitely valid questions around whether 
uh, warranted? They're extremely high. You know, when I mean, I come, I've lived in other countries where you don't pay anywhere near this price for fuel. I know that it's a little bit up high. Uh, I used to uh, travel all the North Island, and there the prices are really uh, more cheaper than here. AA Petrol Pricing Spokesman Mark Stockdale says there is less competition in the South, which is one reason prices are higher which may eventually have some people seeking other means of transport. Daryl Baser, The South Today. A Frankton Motor Camp resident in Queenstown is speaking out about what he describes as being kicked out of his home. Brad Trainer says it's crazy for the Queenstown Lakes District Council to plan to evict him and about 100 other camp residents next year. Sipping coffee at his Frankton Motor Camp home, 64-year-old Brad Trainer reminisced of the little time left in his two-bedroom cabin. The ball got to go. The council said everything the council um, doesn't own has got to be removed off the site. He and about 100 other residents will have to find new homes by August 2019. I believe 105 cabin owners, owners of caravans and cabins and, um, and they're all going to be in the same boat and what, I'm, what I would hate to see is in five years time it's sitting here dead empty and nothing's done to it and everybody's been kicked out. The land which Trainer lives on is partly owned by Queenstown Lakes District Council who has indicated that it would unlikely be used as a motor camp home site in the future. He says it's unfair that he and other residents have to leave, saying it's going to worsen the housing crisis in the resort. He decided to put up his relocatable home for sale this week. Mainly because I can't afford to transport it anywhere and then I don't have anywhere to put it. I've got to buy land to put this somewhere else, and then I've got to pay to have it put there. It would cost up to $10,000 to relocate his home, and another 10000 to get it fitted on new land. Trainer suffered a stroke four years ago, so he can't work and has to rely on government benefits to make ends meet. He's been a resident of the camp on and off since 1998 and wants to stay. He plans to relocate further south of Queenstown to Riverton. However, that's all up in the air. He is sad to see a place revered by many Kiwis as a holiday destination will now be taken away. Mina Amso, The South Today. The Dunedin City Library may be a little less serene than usual this Sunday. The library will hold the third Nook and Cranny Music Festival with local and touring musicians filling the building with sound. This Sunday, the Dunedin City Library will come to life with music from more than 50 artists. The Nook and Cranny Music Festival is in its third year. It's a celebration of Dunedin's eclectic local music scene. Organiser Brendan Christie says the event is about showing what the city's artists have to offer. It's a festival we get every kind of uh, different kind of musician we can in Dunedin to come to one place and perform uh, for 20 minute sets across uh, throughout the library and all the nooks and crannies and um, it's about encouraging people to come and explore a little bit about what the uh, unit what what the Dunedin has to offer in the local music scene. Christy says the festival offers everyone a taste of many different types of music. The weird and the quirky, we've got contemporary, we've got um, classical music, all different kinds and it's, it's, there's something for everyone and I think that uh, shows people's open-mindedness in Dunedin about how they can, uh, they're willing to play in such a diverse kind of music festival. Dunedin City Library's events coordinator Kay Mercer says the public interest in this weekend's festival has been growing over the months. Well the Nook and Cranny Festival is a very exciting time for us and for our customers. We get lots of people interested in it. Um, they're really keen when it's coming, you know, to get fired up about it a couple of months before. So uh, it's something that we plan every year. Um, we've been doing this for three years now, this is our third Nook and Cranny. Um, and it seems to be getting bigger in terms of the audience, so that's really great. We're growing it. Um, fantastic. So yeah, it's just a really lovely, happy event for us. Mercer says enthusiasm for New Zealand Music Month is still going strong. 
I'm often asked, you know, is Music Month still relevant? Well, it certainly is relevant in Dunedin. It certainly is relevant for our libraries. We, we get a lot of customers asking about it all the time. So um, that's why we do it, because the customers want us to. The Nook and Cranny Music Festival is on this Sunday at the Dunedin City Library from 11am until 4pm and is free to the public. Ben Bootsma, The South Today. After the break on Southern Newsweek, Dunedin's Salmon Hatchery is once again the target of vandals and a mural on grain silos in Waimati is now complete. Welcome back. Dunedin Salmon Hatchery has been attacked by vandals for the second time in five months. As in January, equipment was turned off and fish died as a result. A despairing Steve Bennett is at a loss to know why people have again broken into the Dunedin Community Salmon Trust Hatchery for the second time in five months. Bennett outlines what's happened in this second attack. It appears as though vandals have come into the um Hatchery complex again, turned off the aerators on, on one of our tanks that was holding our, our um, uh, we had 45 uh, breeding jacks uh, available to the hatchery for, um, for fertilising the eggs uh, from our brood stock. So uh, we had all, all the jacks in one particular pond and it looks as though somebody's come in and again turned the aerator off and uh, we lost all 45. He says they're grateful for help from salmon producers in South Canterbury but says the hatchery feels targeted. We've, we've got enough through our, uh, a really kind donation from, uh, from Mount Cook Salmon, uh, sorry, Mount Cook Alpine Salmon and High Country Salmon, um, the two organisations up the South Canterbury that, that donated um, some brood stock to us. So we do have enough eggs to see us right for the coming year, but it's, it's really just more uh, disappointing that that somebody feels the need to come in here and kind of disrupt their, their operation. Steve Bennett says they're not wanting revenge on people who are doing this, but simply want to know why. And asks if people have a problem with what the hatchery is doing, to please come forward and chat. I think everyone says to me, you know, what are you going to do when you catch them? And then, you know, you're going to shoot the bastard, all this sort of stuff. Um, ultimately, uh, look, I don't care who's who's responsible or or, or or what your motives are for doing it, but but I just want it to stop. In January, the hatchery was vandalised and the aerators switched off, killing around 200 salmon worth $30,000. The latest loss of fish is said to be worth around $20,000. Police are still investigating the first incident and told the Otago Daily Times no arrests have been made yet. Daryl Baser, The South Today. And the artist behind the murals on the Waimati twin grain silos has finally finished his artwork. The project began in March and depicts notable people from the Waimati area. Halfway between Oamaru and Timaru lies the town of Waimati, slightly off the main highway. The 30 metre high grain silos that tower over the township are now adorned with a mural of some of the town's notable citizens. Artist Bill Scott began painting the silos in March and started with depicting a hongi between Māori leader Te Huruhuru and the area's first European settler Michael Studham. Another of the personalities represented is 1970s Prime Minister Norman Kirk. The Kirk family still still in the area, and um, yes, the orientation of these is quite you know part that we were deliberately doing, and, and you know, orientated them toward each the areas that exist, the Studhams toward their farm, and, and Kirk's up up that area toward them, and yeah. so that was a nice wee twist that we we were able to do yeah. as we did it, and um, just just personalise it a little if you like. World War Two soldier Eric Batchelor is also featured in the mural. Batchelor died in Waimati in 2010 but is survived by family members. Uh, his wife Thursa is still alive and, and her, I've met his son and, and daughters-in-law and, and you know, no, no, I mean there's, there's a lot of people in this town that know Eric and know, knew him well and you know the fact that he ran businesses in the town and lived all his later life here. Yeah. So yeah, he was very much an integral part of the town as a, a cul-de-sac and quite a new one named after him in his honour and 
yeah, yeah. Just a, just a nice guy, you know, nice and humble and got on with it. The last addition to the mural has been New Zealand's first woman registered as a doctor, Margaret Cruikshank, who worked in the district until her untimely death from influenza in 1918. She was involved within the pandemic, you know, the, the influenza epidemic in, in, 18, in 1918, and which ultimately took her life. So, you know, there's, a, there's a, a sad end to that, but, you know, she was a wonderful lady and gave it all her all, literally, and, and, and that was how it ended. The project was commissioned by Barry Sadler of Transport Waimati, and artist Bill Scott is pleased at how much it means to the community. And it's incredible, the actual the pride that people have taken in it and then you know, of course that's very satisfying for me and then Barry and Leanne who have been, you know, sort of instigated it all and got it going and, and, and got it done which is, you know, it, it's a lovely thing. It's quite a small town so we all know each other pretty well. While the grain silo murals stand in Transport Waimati's Queen Street yard, they are visible from all over the township. Rudy Adrian, The South Today. Stewart Islanders are celebrating an exceptionally busy tourist season after a hot summer saw a boom in visitor numbers. An increase of around 9,000 visitors for the year has helped to boost the island's economy. The cold weather is starting to settle in on Stewart Island and the last visitors for the island's tourism season are wrapping up warm for their stay. But a hot Southland summer saw a boost in tourist numbers for the region and a huge increase of around 9,000 extra visitors for Rakiura. We've increased from something like 35,000 people a year to about 44. So for a small community like that, that's a, a pretty big step. So we've been very pleased with that. So it's only just slowed down and uh, that makes an all-round bonus for everybody in town because people have got more work and there's just there's more rubbish, there's more everything and everybody gets a turn. The season has already ended for Churchill Boutique Lodge owner Chris Sierra, who said there were a number of reasons why this season had been so busy. He said there had been a rise in Kiwi tourists who wanted a taste of how New Zealand used to be. The summer was incredibly good weather. It was our it was the best summer I've had since since coming. I think Kiwis who come here go, well, this is what New Zealand used to be like. I remember when it was like this, um, you know, and the kids still wander around and um, yeah, it's a solid community and I think people, you know, it's, it's very Kiwi. Ford said the $5 levy charged to all visitors to the island has gone a long way towards maintaining the island's infrastructure and visitor enhancement projects. It's made a tremendous difference in as much as there were things that we can now do that you couldn't have expected ratepayers to do. And we've uh, had some improvements, rebuilding of some jetties, uh, footpaths, uh, picnic tables, um, all sorts of things that um, visitor related and of course that is the specifics of what that's for. While the busy season may be coming to a close, Rakiora locals will still be welcoming those who don't mind experiencing the wilder elements of the island. Sharon Rees, The South Today. Cromwell is hosting the Tri-Nations Women's Hockey Series this week. The Games will see New Zealand's Black Sticks battle it out against the national teams from Australia and Japan. The South Today met with some of the opposition warming up on the turf. The National Australian Women's Hockey Team, the Hockey Roos, flew into Queenstown on Tuesday. They are here to compete against the New Zealand and Japanese national teams in the Tri-Nations series being held in Cromwell over the next 10 days. Their first training session was yesterday afternoon and defender Carrie McMahon said they were looking forward to the upcoming tournament. Uh, so for us this is great quality opposition that we get to play, um, you know we've had Commonwealth Games recently and we came away with a silver medal so to play quality opposition uh, leading into a World Cup is really important and that's why we're here to play um, some games against the Kiwis and uh, against Japan with um, you know hopes of preparation for us leading into our World Cup. The Australian team are used to slightly warmer weather than what is on offer in the Central Lakes area at the moment. It's great, we've been here for 24 hours, or been to a coffee shop which was good this morning, um, so hopefully get out and see a little bit more on the rest days coming up, but um, so far it's great, it's a little bit chillier than home, but um, so far it's a wonderful little town. 
Hopefully the players will be sufficiently equipped to handle the forecast cold fronts over the next week. Yeah, not too bad. Um, we're well prepared. As you can see, we've got some gloves and some jackets. So um, it's actually, it's really beautiful today. So uh, hopefully the rain stays away and um, we should be good to go. Most of the players at this tournament will meet up again at the Women's Hockey World Cup being held in London later this year. Central Otago News for the South Today. And the Tri-Nations Women's Hockey Series finishes up on Sunday with the deciding final game at 2.30pm in Cromwell. That's all for this edition of Southern Newsweek. Get online and check us out on Facebook or keep up with Southern News via our website, channel39.co.nz. I'm Holly Buchanan, thanks for watching. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.